Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today in Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. I am your host, Scott Branson, along with my co-host, Mr. Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. And also you can catch his Raiders work because he's a columnist writing about the Silver and Black on SportsNot.com. You can also catch him on Select Fridays on TNT, True TV, you name it, uh, he will keep it up. If you follow him on X at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N, you can follow all those appearances and uh, all that stuff. So make sure you do that. You can also follow me on X at LV Gully. The show is SNB Today. Mo, uh, listen, go. I, you know, a couple things happened um, this week so far since we last talked to everybody on Tuesday. Number one is, you know, this this morning I'm writing for sports, not I'm working like you are. We're just kind of chopping away. And I see this thing about Terry on Arnold, of course, the cornerback that I loved and and, and thought, well, we boy, go. if the Raiders pick him in the first round, that'd be great. They, of course, went to Brock Bowers in an article in an interview, I should say. Terry on Arnold said this. I want to say this because they were talking about the fact that he went to the Lions and um, the, the Raiders came up because – uh, Terry Arnold said this, and I'll read the quote so I get it right. Oh, by the way, if you don't already subscribe to the show, can't forget that. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. If you're here on YouTube, please hit the subscription button and that notifications bell. We appreciate that. Okay, it says, quote, the Lions knew that the Raiders were a possibility, Arnold told the Next Round podcast uh, this week. And then Arnold continues and says, quote, and actually the Raiders coach, they called me after the draft and they were like, Hey, we actually had a coin toss between you and Brock Bowers. It landed on him. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So that's what Terry on Arnold said. Um, and uh, we we had, there was a press availability today with, um, with Chips Kelly. I keep calling him Chip Kelly. Champ Kelly. Champ Kelly. Thank you. The C-H, the I-P, <laughs> no, A-M-P. <laughs> Champ Kelly. Of course, who now is in the same, he's an assistant GM there now under Tom Telesco, was asked about it. And he kind of chuckled and said, well, I'm not going to have any comment on that and blah, blah, blah. We're happy we got Brock Bowers. So you saw the fan base on social media go a little ape, especially those people who don't like, or I shouldn't say don't like, were disappointed or thought maybe the Raiders shouldn't have taken Brock Bowers and gone a different direction. You also had national media which is not going to be a surprise to Raider Nation out there, uh, kind of pile on and say, this is how terrible the Raiders decided their draft. This is how they decided how to draft in the first round. So, again, I think I think Champ Kelly, what he said, was not just uh, avoiding the question. My feeling in watching it live, as I did, was Champ Kelly's like, yeah, don't be ridiculous, right? Um, and I know, Mo, you had a strong opinion on this because you posted on it as well. But but what do you make of this? And tell me your thoughts on CoinGate. <laughs> CoinGate. So number one, it's silly to think that a GM would make a decision on a first round pick with his first ever pick with a new team using a coin between two players. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Tom Telesco has been drafting for 11 years before he got to the Raiders. You mean to tell me a 12-year experienced GM is panicked because the quarterbacks went early or his guy went off the board before he thought he would, and he's going to flip a coin to decide who's going to be the Raiders' first-round draft pick at 13, give me a break. That's the, that's, the, that's the surface of it. It's silly on its face because we all know if English is your first language. Most of us have heard the term <laughs> or phrase, oh, it's a coin toss between this and this and that. If you're making a serious decision, you're not actually literally flipping a coin to make the decision. If you're making a frivolous small decision, as I, I use the example on the X, I said, if I wanted to choose between drinking apple juice or drinking iced tea in the morning, yeah, I may flip a coin because it's not a serious <laughs> decision. But if I'm picking where to live between New York City and, and Philadelphia, I'm not flipping a coin for that. I'm just saying that it's a close decision. Now, if we want to dig deeper into this discussion, I'm seeing these 
takes to say the Raiders, because there wasn't a quarterback on the board, the Raiders panicked and picked Brock Bowers. So this coin toss discussion is more than just, you know, a misinterpretation of a of a of a phrase, of a figure of speech. It's aimed at the Raiders to say this Raider team is still incompetent when it comes to drafting players in the first round. Now the Raiders wear that label because Cleve Farrell, Damon Arnett, mm-hmm. Alex Leatherwood, we get it. So they've been the butt of jokes with their first round picks in previous years. But as I said, since the passing of Al Davis, the Raiders have, have picked first time GMs, Reggie McKenzie, Mike Mayock, Dave Ziegler, right? This time they went with an experienced GM because I think Mark Davis is tired of being the butt of all those jokes. So he went out and got a, an experienced GM who can handle these situations. So again, this is aimed at poking fun at the Raiders and saying, oh, look at the stupid Raiders. They're, they're, they're making their picks based on a coin toss. Ha, ha, ha. You know, it, that's, what it, that's what it goes back to. And that's what I'm fighting against that. Yeah, I understand the previous picks have been whiffs and blunders, but this is a different GM a GM who's experienced, way more experienced than the previous GMs, and you're not making those serious decisions based on a coin flip. Let's right. And and I kind of sense that maybe this might be your column. Uh, I, I don't know. But <laughs> but uh, but I, I so I, it's it, on the face of it, it's ridiculous. OK, it because I know there are some incompetent people. We talked about the Falcon situation and them drafting Penix. And that is a fair criticism because you're like, what? And, and you can question Terry Fontenot because what are you doing? Uh, in this situation, also, I read the quote as I, as I did to start the show. Um, not only a, a, a phrase, like you said, um, it, you know, to flip a coin is, is, a, is, a, is a phrase that you use for a lot of different things and you use it in general. Number two, the important part, too, I think people miss with this, Mo, is this was a coach a coach said this to Terry. Uh, this is what Terry on Arnold, and I don't. It's not. I'm not doubting Terry on Arnold that he, that he heard this and how he interpreted it. I disagree with, but this came from a coach. And if you know anything about sports, professional, I mean, even even in business, it the whole thing is about relationship. So even if you don't draft a player, you never know when you're going to be. Coaches get fired. They go to other places. They might be playing with the player. So you're going to tell them something that makes them feel good about not being drafted by the Raiders because you probably were telling them up into the draft, we really like you. If you're there, we might take you. You know, there's a good chance we'll take you. You're telling them this on the phone because it was one of the options they maybe had. Okay. So you have that. So what he said to Terry on Arnold, whoever this coach was, we don't know who it was, was not a GM, was not Champ Kelly, the assistant GM. It was a coach. So, yes. And we are members of the media mo, and we have on our websites that we work for great content, but we also, there's stuff that websites jump on to your point to try to make somebody look good. It definitely will generate clicks. The headline that I saw was, yes, it's an embarrassment. The Ra- this is how the Raiders decided their first round pick and whatever website that was, they know they're going to get people to click on it. Cause if I wasn't involved with the Raiders at all, I would click on it. Cause like, what the hell is this? So they get their click, but I'm with you on this one. And I think if anybody believes that that's what they did, then just go home because look, (laughs) the Raiders have had their share of incompetence. There's no question. Every organization, at least most of them go through that. And you just did a masterful job of outlining first time GMs and the problems and all that stuff. In this case, let's be real. And again, I tell Raider Nation, and somebody somebody actually posted this to me today on X, which was the national media will always try to use the Raider because they know Raider fans are rabid. They know you guys are the most loyal fans in the world. So they're going to pull the buttons and, and, and trigger on a story like that because it's sensational. So after we talk about it today, I'm done with it because I think it's just crap. Uh, he was asked about it. As I said, Champ Kelly said he just laughed it off. His reaction, you can go watch it. It's up on X.com, the press conference or on YouTube. You can watch what he said about it. He just didn't justify it with a real answer because it didn't deserve one. The, the problem, Scott, I don't want to say problem, but the thing why I think it generated a lot of dis- discussion, because I was initially, I wasn't going to comment on it because I was yeah. just like, oh, yeah, coin toss. I, I get the phrase, right? I've heard the phrase a bunch of times already in my lifetime. And I just kind of brushed it off. But the reason it started to gain steam and the reason I commented on it multiple times on the X is because 
legitimate journalists started writing about this. Not that they're saying that it was a possibility it was a coin toss, but legitimate journalists were talking about this coin toss decision. And yep. when you have legitimate journalists posting or putting the, the coin toss question in the headline, fans are going to start asking questions. Did they really do a coin toss? It just really happened. You know, so when I saw that, I that's when I said, okay, I, I'm going to comment and put my two cents in and say, hey, it's a it's a figure of speech. If you you know, no GM that's been around for over a decade <laughs> is is making those tough decisions based on a coin toss. This is why they have draft boards. Yeah. We always talk about following your board, right? So even if you have a, de a debate, let's say Tom Telesco and Antonio Pierce were having a heated debate, and Pierce won at Terry and Arnold, and Tom Telesco won at Brock Bowers. They're not going to pull out a hey, hey AP, could you pull out a quarter real quick and let's let's do this, let's settle this over a coin toss. No, that's not going to happen. Let's right. look at the board, let's look at our roster, and we'll make the best decision possible. And that's probably what happened. Correct. And and to your point about the draft board, right? They have their guys by position, but they also have them listed, you know, one through whatever number they go up to, whatever they decide right. to go up to, four hundred, whatever it is. They have it listed. So I'm assuming Jaden Daniels was number one, but they knew they weren't going to get him. Okay. So my assumption is, and if there wasn't another quarterback, which we have not had any indication, they did have some interest in Penix. I still don't think they would have taken Penix at 13. But nonetheless, um, um, maybe he was there. Maybe he was two. Maybe he was three. I don't know. But Brock Bowers had to be at the top of their list, right? They had him there. And, and when the way that, that I've heard GMs and scouts talk about it is that you even have guys on your list, high on your list, that you don't even think you have a shot of getting, Right. But if they happen to be there, so if you have Brock Bowers number three on your list, you're thinking, yeah, we're not going to get him. But then you get to number 13, and guess what? The top guy left on your board is still Brock Bowers. And let's say Terry on Arnold was number five. That's where I see a coach saying, well, it was a coin flip. I mean, you were right there. If Brock Bowers would have been gone, we might have taken you. If I, if he would have said it that way, this isn't a story. And, and you bring up a good point, too, because there are legitimate journalists uh, commenting on it. And, and I, I would tell you guys out there, you shouldn't get mad at that. They're just kind of echoing what's been reported out there. Right. Um, but, but again, and I think it'll come up again the next time they talk to Tom Telesco or maybe if they talk to Antonio Pierce, if he's available soon with the rookie minicamp coming. Um, so it'll, it'll, I think it'll be a 24-hour thing, but I'm sure one of the press pool in Las Vegas will ask about it again uh, to try to get an answer, a definitive answer. But again, it's much ado about nothing. I think that it doesn't matter. Brock Bowers is a fine player. I like Terry on Arnold too. I'm not holding it against him. He shared his story. I have no fault with him sharing his story. But again, right. it is a phrase <sighs> and a figure of speech that was, I think, taken out of context by the kid. Just want to be clear. We're not attacking Terry on Arnold. No. Because of what he was told. We, I believe he was told exactly what he said. Yes. We're not attacking journalists who, who put the coin toss question in their story. As you no. said, they're reporting what's being said, right? You got it. You got to ask the question. What, what, what we're saying is understand that this is a figure of speech and it's, it's basically a non-story and don't fall into the trap of, of oh, this is how the Raiders handle their draft process by flipping a coin to make these big decisions. That's what I'm pushing back against. Correct. That narrative that the same old Raiders making dumb decisions in the most, you know, inefficient way possible <laughs> and that's I, I think that's what you have to watch out for with this non coin toss story 100 percent. and i would say this too to raider nation out there i mean your fans you do what you want we know social media 50 percent of it is nothing but a toxic cesspool so you can expect every chiefs fan every broncos fan every chargers fan, fan every awful. troll who knows you're a raider fan because you have it in your bio or you talk about the raiders they're going to make comments to you. But again, you can you can respond to them, you can insult them, you can do whatever you do, but that's where it's going to play out. People are going to use it against Raider fans and Raider Nation, uh, but it's got no value. It doesn't matter. And again, I go back to Antonio Pierce's resume on the field. So don't worry about it. Um, and I think that, uh, again, it, it is what it is and it's over. Now, the other story that, that broke late Wednesday, Mo, actually the, 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 the move of training camp to Costa Mesa, California, back to Southern California. I wrote a story about this on, up on uh, Sports Not as well. But you, uh, it was approved. The city council down in Costa Mesa or Board of Supervisors, whatever they have down there, approved it. So they approved it. It's all good. 
Uh, but then Vinny Bonsignore, Albert Breer, I'll have you read the Albert Breer thing in a second here, but um, there, there is an issue with it. And it brings up a really big question that I think this, this is much more important story, I think, to all of you out there. I'm not going to decide what's important to you, but I think is that with training camp going to Southern California, a lot of you said to me uh, through the interwebs that, awesome, you know, I'm in Southern California. We got lots of folks in LA uh, that are down there in San Diego that are, that are Raiders fans. And they were excited because they can go up and see it in Costa Mesa. The issue, though, now is there's going to be some restrictions. And, and I thought this, and I'm kicking myself for not, not bringing it up and asking the question, which is the Rams and Chargers own that market. They own the Southern California market. So um, Vinny reported that there's going to be some restrictions on how they market the team in Southern California. So the NFL is going to tell them, you can do this, you can't do that. Albert Breer kind of gives some more details. Mo, tell them about that and really the big issue that here, which I think worth talking about uh, because it has to do with the fans out there. So I don't want to misquote Albert Breer, so bear with me. I'm going to read it word for word as he posted on the X. Albert, This is from Albert Breer on Wednesday, late Wednesday, Wednesday evening. I found out earlier today that there is a league rule preventing teams from hosting fan events in competing markets, being the Raiders and Saints wouldn't be able to open practices to fans. In parentheses, he says the Cowboys are grandfathered in, so they're exempt from that. Mm. He says, we'll see what the what they negotiate with the L.A. team. So it's a negotiable thing here. Not to say that fans aren't allowed to the practices off the top. It's If fans are allowed in, it's going to have to be negotiated with the L.A. teams. Right. So for, for everyone who plan to go to those practices, there's a possibility there could be some restrictions, may not be allowed to certain practices. Who knows? We'll see what they negotiate in the near future. Yeah, and it's it, it's really interesting because and, and you're right, the Saints are impacted too. So it's not just the yes. Raiders. So don't think it's 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 the NFL uh with a Raider grudge. <laughs> um, the Raiders, yes. It's it's the Saints too. And you talked about the Cowboys mm -hmm. and Oxnard, they've been there forever. So so they were grandfathered in, as you said. So what's interesting about that, because the way you read it was and, and what Albert Breer, again, I'm paraphrasing, but you can go check out his tweet and I'll I'll retweet it from the Silver and Black Today handle uh for you guys to look at uh today, is that no fan events. Now, what is a fan event? We don't know. But he also said practices. Now, if if fans, if if they can't negotiate a way for fans to go see practices like they usually do at training camp, that's a big problem. But I to me, it's a hiccup. Like you said, they got to negotiate. Now, we do know Mark Davis is good friends with uh, Spanos, uh, the owner of the Chargers, with Alex Spanos, or not Alex. Sorry. So so. They are good friends, so maybe they work on it. Now, you got the Rams. The, the Raiders and Rams are not close organizationally. Stan Kroenke, I'm not saying they don't get along, but you know what happened with the stadium with the Raiders and Chargers, and then all the Rams came in, and that all went to hell. So I don't know what the relationship is like with the Rams. Uh, so, so to me, we don't know enough yet. I think this is something that's going to play out between today, Thursday, Friday, and into next week. I mean, they have some time to deal with it. But but I would guess that the the Los Angeles teams will restrict them from doing certain things, but they won't restrict them from having fans come to practice. Those fans are not going to go to Charger mm -hmm. practices. They're not going to go to Rams practices. Mm -hmm. And and again, the the, char the 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 Chargers are now going to be in El Segundo. The Rams are up there too. So so you look at the Raiders. They're in. They're going to be in Orange County. So it, it, there's a lot of space in between those sites. I think they'll work it out, Mo. Yeah, I think they're working. I don't think they want that animosity to have to shut completely shut out Raider fans because then what if Raider fans show up to their practices and you know, oh, that, you know, I, that, idea. you know, that could happen. I, so I don't think for that reason you don't want that backlash, right? Especially in that in that area, you know, there's a heavy Raider fan contingency there. You don't want to. You don't want to stir that fire. So I think they will. They will negotiate something where fans will be allowed, maybe to. An extent, as you said, there'll probably be restrictions there because you don't want the Raider fans completely taken over. But you, I think you, you, you should include them simply because, again, that backlash could be heavy on the back end. Right, and to repeat, the Saints have the same issue because the Saints are having camp in Southern California too. So this is an issue that's going to impact two teams negotiating with two other teams, and uh, you know I'm sure it'll be something around camp broadcast. It, you know, not that they do 
broadcasting camp. I mean, obviously media is there, but but they don't do any kind of live stuff. So so my guess is they will come up with something and they will be restricted from doing some events. Yeah. Uh, but like you said, the NFL has the data. They know, they know yeah. how many people are Raiders fans in Los Angeles. It's a huge, huge number. As I said, we have, even on our show, our little show here, majority of our downloads right on a weekly basis big number of them come from los angeles so <laughs> raider nation uh is still alive and strong and will never die in my view even through generations um in southern california so i think they'll work it out and, and it'll be interesting to see what those restrictions are for the raiders versus the saints i would imagine it'll be equal as close as it can be so so it's it's one of those things we'll keep an eye on and, and I think we'll get some clarification in the next few days on, and of course we'll, we'll talk about it here, but very interesting. Cause I think, I think too, the excitement around the Raiders going down there, probably, probably the NFL got a phone call from one of those teams saying, Whoa, this is our territory. What are you doing? Oh, uh, hello. I think that's what happened. So somebody, somebody tattled, somebody's a rat. No, I'm just kidding. But, well, but you know what I'm saying. Money too, Scott. NFL is not going to turn down money. Raider fan money. They're just not going to do it. You know, yeah. if, they, if the NFL could turn it into cash for themselves, they're going to, they're going to be all in on it. So that's not right. the why they're not going to shut the fans out. Right. And it might be something to the effect of, Hey, saints and Raiders, um, you need to make a donation to the charger foundation and the Ram foundation that helps, you know, pay for kids sports could be something I'm hoping that's what it is. Cause that, that would help the community and the teams, those other teams and their right. community. So um, to me, that makes a lot of sense. And I know, I know the, in, the, in the agreement too, anyway, with Costa Mesa, the, the Raiders were going to buy tickets for kids to attend games in Southern California. So they have to right. be Chargers or Rams games. Uh, so they were already trying to, I think, do good there and, and make sure that uh, kids in Los Angeles could go see some football games. So we'll see how it goes, but it was really interesting uh, for that to come up at the last minute because there's a lot of excitement around, a lot of attention around it. So we'll have to see how that goes. That's more of a story than coin flip cake, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. More um, Way more important story. Yes. Also, too, real quick before we get to the break, because we want to get to Carl. We have eight callers today. We want to get to that. Um, and one of the things, too, I, I wrote a piece, Mo, on Brock Bowers. I don't know if you saw this report, too, from Jeremy Fowler about uh, he had several NFL scouts tell him that they felt Brock Bowers – was the best prospect in the entire draft. So this came from Jeremy Fowler and it came from NFL scouts. Uh, and so, so for those of you who are still on the fence with Brock Bowers, I mean, they had the one person, and this is what Fowler said, is that they had him ranked higher than Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison Jr. So just to let you know, and, and, and that's not to be sensational. That's just to say this is how much the NFL as an organization, I know he fell to 13 because of the quarterback picks, but this is how much the NFL and NFL front offices thought of Brock Bowers. Scott, what, what did I say when he was picked? My employer, BR, right behind me. We have him ranked as the number two overall prospect in the class behind Marvin Harrison Jr. Marvin we had, Harrison. We yep. had Chip Towers on from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution tell you you wouldn't be surprised if he turns into – Pro Bowl, All Pro player, and eventually goes to the Hall of Fame. Now we'll yeah. see what happens there. But this goes back to my my point about the whole coin toss thing, where people are trying to say, "Well, the Raiders panicked and picked Brock Bowers." <laughs> you don't panic into a top prospect in a class. No, that's intentional. Whether you think it's a luxury pick or not, because he's labeled a tight end. Chip Champ Kelly said it today that he's not just he's while his position is a tight end, he's an offensive playmaker, and that's the point that I made even on draft day that. If you look at him as just as just a tight end, then you're probably upset. But if you're looking at Brock Bowers as an offensive playmaker who can move around the formation, then you understand the pick. Yeah, and thanks for bringing it up too, because Mike Sando and the Athletic wrote about it as well. And one of the NFL executives, so I'm assuming a GM, um, that's the they use executives to make sure they hide the name so they don't tell who their sources are. But uh, Mike Sando, who's a great writer at the Athletic, he he's that's what that's what one executive told him is that it was a luxury pick. He called Brock Bowers for the Raiders a luxury pick because he, he, in essence, paraphrasing said, I don't know what they're building. Like, well, so what? Everybody's got different opinions 
And uh, while that might be the opinions of some GMs, other GMs are like, wow, they're they scored at 13. That might be the opinion of one of the other AFC West GMs. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it was Brett Veach or George Payton or, exactly. or um, jo uh, Jose, Joe Ortiz, Joe Ortiz, Ortiz in, yeah. uh, in Los Angeles. I wouldn't be surprised if it was one of the rival GMs saying that. So when you get anonymous quotes like that, a lot of times it's from the rival GM just trying to poke at the poke at their rival correct versus the other thing from fowler which is these are scouts and it, you know it's not going to be a raider scout so obviously his other scouts saying the kid was amazing yeah. so yeah. so again it's you know we try to clear but you're right with with anonymous quotes um they're useful because you have to do that in order to keep your sources but you have to take it with a great assault just like pre-draft when it was lying season some of these guys are upset. Maybe they had them on their board and they couldn't get them. Uh, yeah. So it's one of those things where you see that play out that way. So, but anyway, that's interesting. That's kind of the news we've had in the last couple of days. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to get to that stuff with you, uh, but tell us what you think too in the comments below, or if you're watching us on X or Facebook or wherever you're watching us, you can let us know what you think about all of that. Uh, but we're going to, now we're going to take a break. We're going to flip a coin to decide whether we come back or not. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, we're going to come back and we're going to get to your calls here on this off season edition of silver and black today. We're going to get to the Raider nation mailbag with a lot of things to say, a lot of folks calling in. So don't go anywhere. You're with Mo, you're with Scott. This is silver and black today. Welcome back silver and black today, segment two. And we are getting into our weekly, weekly Raider nation mailbag. We're taking your voicemails and as i say that in case you're watching and you don't remember what the number is i'm flashing it up there so you can get on next week 702-900-7869 is the number 702-900-7869 i'll leave it up there for a, a few minutes and i'll put it in the description below so if you're watching us after the fact or you're listening to us we will have it in the description of the podcast and the video so you guys can always find access to it as well as the latest and greatest journalism magic from Mr. Mo Moten. So you can get links to his latest stuff down below. You can also get links to my stuff. So there you go. All right, let's get to these calls. And, and first we're gonna go to Travis in my hometown of San Diego. Here's Travis. Let me turn this up so you guys can actually hear it. Here we go. Hey guys, what's up? This is Travis from San Diego, California. So, wow, man, Brock Bowers, who would have known? <laughs> So I wanted to talk about Luke Getty actually, because a lot of us think we're going to do a lot of 12 personnel, 22 personnel with two tight ends, which I, I know we will, but I'm all, I was looking through the history of Luke Getty and where he spent his time. I think it's important to note that he spent time with the Green Bay Packers before the Chicago Bears. Uh, more importantly, the time he spent with De Devontae Adams, he was a receivers coach, uh, for the Green Bay Packers during the time Devontae Adams was there. And I think some key notes um, to look out for is uh, his the years he spent in 2019, 2020, and 2021. Aaron Rodgers won 2020, um, he, sorry, 2020, he won the MVP. So just keep that in mind. Um, in 2021, he had another spectacular season and so did Devontae Adams. During that time, Getty was pass game coordinator <laughs> and quarterbacks coach. So I went back, looked at the highlights, and that offensive scheme was much different than what the Bears ran in 2022 and 2023 when Getty was often the coordinator. So I can, it's kind of obvious that Getty tailored his offense t towards Justin Fields and the RPO and, you know, heavy sets. So obviously we don't have that quarterback available, so I'm thinking we're going to see a lot more of the Packers West Coast scheme with Devontae Adams being there, and he's familiar with it. And the reason why I was bringing this up, because I just heard in the Crosby, uh, Max Crosby podcast and Devontae Adams, he actually brought up the scheme they're going to be running um, with the Raiders in Getty. And he said there's a lot of the terminology is the same from before, so he knows the offense, he's used to it. So that just kind of tells me that, they're going to go more what the Packers are running during his time there. So, you know, just a little nugget for Raider fans. I would go back and just check out some Packer, you know, highlights in the 2020 and 2021 season. Not saying we're not going to see two tight end sets, but 
I think we're going to see a lot more what Packers ran during that time because I think that's what more gets you familiar with. You know, he got stuck with a scrambling quarterback, you know, and, you know, we all know what happened there. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Um, and keep up the good work. Peace out. Travis, what a call. That's a great call. I mean, his research. He, yes, he did his research and noticed some really good things. And Mo, he brings up now, of course, Getsy ran through a couple different positions with the Packers before he became the OC down in Chicago. But but what what can we learn? Is he got a point there as far as um, the quarterback? Because that's it's, it's true. When you have a different quarterback with a different skill set, the Raiders don't have a highly mobile or running quarterback. They have Minshew, who is a little bit functional mobility, uh, but obviously Aiden O'Connell is not. So what do you what do you make of that? And what Travis's point is there? So a couple of things here. You talked about Lou Getze as a passing game coordinator. I just want to note that. Even if you're a passing game coordinator, it doesn't mean you completely run the passing game offense. Some passing game coordinators, and if you can, you can read back with Packers fans, they talked about Luke Getze running the third down offense. And uh, I think it was Stenovich running goal line offense. So they had their passing attack as far as a play calling perspective split up. So different coaches handled different situations. One coach handled third downs. One coach handled goal line situations. One coach handled, you know, early down. So it wasn't all Luke Getzi. I just want to make that clear. When you when you look at Luke Getzi's track record as a passing game coordinator with the Packers, he wasn't making all the play calls for the passing game. That was divvied up among the coaches. That's number one. Number two, he brought up Aaron Rodgers having an MVP year, which is correct. Aaron Rodgers did have MVP years in that stretch with Luke Getzi there. But – it wasn't like Luke Getzey turned Aaron Rodgers into an MVP. Remember, Aaron <laughs> Rodgers had won two MVPs before Luke Getzey got that position. So I want to make that clear, too, that I see people saying, well, Aaron Rodgers is MVP when Luke Getzey was a passing coordinator. He was already an MVP player before he got there. Yes. Now, what I will say is, it is you should look at what the Packers have done because you want to run things that players are familiar with because it makes the install a lot easier when you're walking into a door and you're introducing an offense, especially to a quarterback who's not familiar with your offense. It helps that your star wide receiver knows the offense. So that's a check mark there for me. I don't criticize Luke Getzey as far as how he works with pass catchers. Not only did he work with Devontae Adams, and Devontae Adams had some highlight years in Green Bay, look at his look at his years in Chicago with Cole Komet. I've made this point multiple times that Cole Komet yes. had great progression under Luke Getzey as an offensive coordinator. Now, I, I've, that, and this is why I like the Brock Bowers pick. This is why I don't have doubts about maybe the receiver talent they're bringing in. But if you look at Luke Getzey's history, Aaron Rodgers aside, because I don't give him credit for developing Aaron Rodgers, when has Luke Getzey taken a young quarterback and elevated his game? You can go to Mississippi State. You can go back to his time at Indiana and Pennsylvania, not Indiana, IU, Indiana, Indianapolis, but Indiana and Pennsylvania. You go back that far. Go back to his time in West Virginia. Mm. There's no real track record for him elevating the quarterback play. So while I, I agree with the caller in, in saying, look at the Green Bay Packers, it could work with the receivers and the pass catchers that they have. My concern is, when is he going to finally develop a quarterback? Now, you can you can criticize Justin Fields all you want because he's a Floyd quarterback. We understand that. That's why he's a backup in Pittsburgh now. But when you don't have the proven track record of developing a young quarterback who wasn't an MVP before you got there, Aaron Rodgers, you're going to have question marks. And that's where my questions lie. Yeah, no, great, great response there. And and Travis, again, amazing call, brother. Yeah. And we appreciate it. And I think, yeah. too, that, great yeah, call. you have to you have to look at things and, and not read too much into it based on the past. I mean, to me, the recency, maybe I'm I'm I'm. I'm bias to recency, but the recency, what he did in Chicago to me, I think you're right about, about the Packers. The other thing I want to say is too, uh, about the 12 personnel and the two tight end sets. Um, and, and we said this the last show, Brock Bowers is not a regular tight end. He's, right. he's completely different. It's a different mold. So you're going to see Brock Bowers in at the same time as Michael Mayer, but it's not going to be a two tight end set. It's going to be, he might be in the slot. He might even be outside Mo. I mean, you, you, that's how, if you look at the stuff, I would, I would invite everybody to go watch some of this, the highlights. And if you have any time, maybe even like a quarter of a game 
from Georgia last year and see how they brought, they even had him at H back. Like the, he can play anywhere on the field. That's why the, the scouts were so excited about Brock Bowers because he's not a regular tight end and why Michael Mayer's role is not changing. It's going to be the same as what they drafted him for. Brock Bowers is going to be doing something completely different. That doesn't mean that they won't have a 12 personnel set and have a quote unquote two tight end sets and use them in a more traditional way. But I think this is this is what's great about Powers is you can do anything with him. He's like a Swiss army knife on the offense. And for the Raiders and, and how they've built up their wide receiver room now with some more depth and some speed, it bodes well for the offense. One thing I will say that Travis said that sticks out to me and that it's a glimmer of hope for Raiders fans who, who may be iffy on Luke Getzey like I am, the fact that he also brought that Getzey is willing to tailor the offense to the quarterback. So different offense with Green Bay than he had with Chicago. That's a positive because you want your your offensive coordinator to fit the offense around the talent that he has and not try to squeeze, you know, the players that he has into his, you know, narrow-minded look of an offense. So right. that's something to look forward to that he's going to tailor the offense around Gardner Minshew or Aiden O'Connor, whoever wins the job, and they'll have those pass-catching weapons to expand that passing game and score some points. And And again – it was Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> right. One of the, they don't, Raiders don't have any Aaron Rodgers right now. No. One of the, <laughs> and, I'm not, and I'm not criticizing the Raiders quarterbacks because Aaron Rodgers, he's one of the best to ever play the game. I know he only won one Super Bowl. I get that. But he's still one of the best players to ever play the game at the position. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, much it, not not that Luke Getzey didn't help him, but right. I'll take that job. <laughs> I'll be his quarterback coach. Right. I think he it, did pretty well. It, it, it's one thing when, you, when you're – an offensive coordinator, you have a great quarterback. How many times have we seen offensive coordinators coach great quarterbacks and they go elsewhere and they're not all of a sudden, oh, their offensive genius goes away all of a sudden? No, a lot of that is the quarterback. Not, not that we're taking away credit from Luke Getzey, but you also got to give a lot of credit to Aaron Rodgers for executing that offense. And the Rays, again, don't have an Aaron Rodgers type player right now. No question. Travis, great call. Okay, next call, we're going out to Las Vegas. Here we go. Hey, Scott and Mo, this is Nick from Vegas. Hey, first time caller. Um, first want to say you guys have an awesome show. Ever since I found you guys, I've been listening every week. And your only downfall is you don't have more uh, episodes. <laughs> we do during but, the season. Uh, anyways, hey, um, the draft. Um, I was kind of like a lot of uh, other people, very confused on that first pick. Um, but as I have thought about it more i'm actually really excited i was not on the the bandwagon of trading up trading the farm for Jaden daniels um i think gardner Minshew is more than capable um a lot uh, excuse me a lot more capable than people think um getting this team to the playoffs my question is and my concern is um brock bowers and uh, michael mayer very big mismatches the defense and when you add on Devonte adams and jacoby myers um there is a ton of weapons so my concern is that uh, luke gets is not going to be able to utilize it correctly um i think if i remember right Komet had a great year with luke gets last year but i just i don't know luke gets track record um as far as uh, utilizing his weapons like that it's just specifically a uh, two tight end set um, so just curious your thoughts on that, but, um, otherwise I'm very excited and I think, uh, uh, Minshew and this offense could really, um, take these guys to the playoffs with this defense. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. I'm out. All right, Nick in Vegas, Nick, good call there too. Call. And Mo, one point I want to make about this too, because you and I both, when, when Luke Getzey was hired. And look, the guy does, he, he, you know, you got to give him a chance. Okay. Number one. Absolutely. Number two, though, we said it was just kind of like a, eh, okay, not real excited. We have doubts. So he's got every opportunity. And, and I think what Nick brought up there was that, boy, they have now, they have a lot of weapons on offense now, right? We'll talk about the offensive line in a second, but they have weapons. So if they get good quarterback play, whether it be out of Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew, whoever wins that battle, okay. Uh, if they get good quarter, it doesn't have to be great quarterback play. It has to be good quarterback play, getting the ball to the weapons. Okay. Then to me, yes, I think there, I don't think there's pressure on Minshew or on O'Connell or even as much on Pierce. I think there's a lot of pressure even going in 
on Luke Getze because there's not a lot of excuses there. Uh, maybe quarterback if they both don't perform well, but I, I doubt that both these quarterbacks will just crap the bed. I think they'll do fine. So <clears throat> this is something you've said before, which is like, okay, Luke Getze, I mean, you're going to have to come in and instantly, I say instantly, you're going to have to show that you know how to use these guys. If not, you could be a one and done guy. I said it the night that they drafted Brock Bowers. This puts a lot of pressure on Luke Getze simply because you can look at that offense on paper and say, on paper, this should be a, a decent offense, assuming right. the quarterback play is serviceable, right? Mm -hmm. You got Brock Bowers now. You got Michael Mayer, who you, you traded up for in the second round last year. You got Devontae Adams, who's still a top wide receiver. Jacoby Myers had a pretty good year as number two last year. Trey Tucker's your speed in the slot. And now you add Michael Gallup. You got Jalen Guyton, who's a former Charger guy. That Tom Telesco from there was. So you got some speed. You got some guys with starting experience with a lot of catches in, in a season. You got all of these playmakers. If you can't put more than 20 points on the board like we saw last season, your seat's going to get hot really quick. And they're going to say, well, you didn't have a, a great quarterback, but you had all these playmakers and you didn't do much with it. So pre to me, the pressure's on Luke Getzey. And I will say this about Gardner Minshew. This is my one fear about Gardner Minshew. I said Garner Mitchell is a low end starter, bridge gap spot starter guy. Let's keep in mind, while last year he got the Colts close to the playoffs, let's keep in mind who was the offensive coordinator with the Colts or the offensive play call, Shane Steichen. Shane Steichen was the guy who got Justin Herbert to break rookie records. Shane Steichen was the guy that got Jalen Hurts to the Super Bowl, helped that offense, the Eagles offense get to the Super Bowl. Jalen Hurts signs this big contract. What happens? Shane Steichen goes to Indianapolis and Jalen Hurts all of a sudden doesn't look the same. Now, I'm fearing there's going to be a drop-off seeing Gardner Minshew under Shane Steichen versus seeing Gardner Minshew under Luke Getze, simply because Shane Steichen has a more proven resume. I just ran down the numbers for you. Justin Herbert, great work there, rookie records. Jalen Hurts, that Eagles offense, goes to the Super Bowl, drops off and collapses last year without Shane Steichen. Then Shane Steichen goes to Indianapolis. Indianapolis has a top-10 scoring offense. By the way, they didn't have Jonathan Taylor for a lot of the season. They lost their starting quarterback in Anthony Richardson midway through the year, and Gardner Mitchell had to step in. So Shane Steichen is the magic guy there. Now, I don't know what version of Gardner Mitchell we're going to get. I will say Gardner Mitchell did play well in Jacksonville when that team was a, a dumpster fire. But that's to, re to re reiterate the point that I've made and that the caller made. It's all on Luke Getze. If he's able to show that he could be a proven offensive play call, even though there are questions, the Rays offense should be fine. If not, they may be looking for a new coordinator in 2025, regardless of the quarterback position. Yes. And um, I, just just to make sure, you're talking about um, Shane Steichen, right? Yes. Uh, there he is. Look at him. UNLV, baby. <laughs> there he is playing oh, football. Boy. Okay. Oh, I, boy. To, I just had to, had to put that in there. I just had to get that in there. But yes. So, oops. I, and now I go back to my screen. I'm a bad director right now. What is this? I'm I believe, I believe Luke Getze was also a former quarterback. He was. Yes. So, so, so no, you, you may, and, and I agree with you. I think, I think that the pressure is all there. And again, you know, if you said it perfectly, if they get serviceable play from the quarterback and your point about Steichen calling plays versus Luke Getzey calling plays, you're going to be able and again, people suddenly think that we're negative on Aiden O'Connell. We're not, but if Minshew, I'm going to give him a little bit of an edge because he's been in the league longer. OK, he's got a little more mobility. He's got a little more of this, a little more of that. So if 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 O'Connell wins out, different story, different quarterback play calling can change a little bit. With Minshew in there, you know what you got. You saw it to your point. You saw last year in Indianapolis. If Minshew goes out there and it's not working at all, what's the difference? Right. And that's what you're getting at. Is what's the difference? Yeah, the difference isn't caller. Gardner Minshew. The get, difference caller. is the play caller. So we'll see. But Nick, uh, great call, man. And um, we do more, more shows during the season. We, we do two during the offseason. During the regular season, we're doing four or five sometimes. So stick with us on that one. But, you know, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. All right. Now we go back out to California for our next call. Hey, Scott and Mo. This is uh, T. Dougie in California. T. Doug! Um, I saw the draft uh, last week. I, I like Brock Bowers. I like JPJ. I'm hoping Glaze ends up being uh, someone we can put in and tackle at some point. Um, really, you know, you can't be upset at how it fell based off production, but not getting a quarterback just it, it really, really bums me out still because 
if I really think about the league and all the situations that every team is in, are at this point is it only the Raiders and maybe the Seahawks, the only teams that doesn't have at least what they think is a future quarterback? So, you know, the team's looking good on defense. You know, the weapons are there. It's just, you know, we talked about it in the off season, or, you know, hey, don't sweat over the wins. We can get, you know, we can get up in the draft with, with a trade. And I kept telling myself, you know, but these are, this is such a talented class. I just don't see anybody trading down. And that was what we talked about. That's what I heard on the show and all the other shows. It's like, hey, you know, we can trade up. Teams trade up all the time. And there was zero trades um, made. And I know it, has, it takes two to tango, but it's just crazy how we talked about it for I don't know how many months and, and nothing ever came to fruition. Michael Penix, a second round pick, laughable. Um, mm -hmm. It's just funny how we, we talk about all these, you know, scenarios and we end up taking Brock Bowers. I mean, that's just how it goes sometimes. But yeah, just uh, hopefully, you know, uh, Gardner Mitch is the guy for AOC. But I'm just, if we get a playoff berth, you know, I'm happy and trade everything next year for a quarterback. That's all I got, guys. Thanks for taking my call. All right. There you go. T. Dougie. Thanks, man. We appreciate Dougie. your call from California. Mo, what do you, what do you think? So we, we've been pouring cold water on the trade up some dream scenario all off season saying, look, these quarterbacks are just too good to pass up on for teams that are rebuilding and need a quarterback. And I, I, well, I said the sliver of hope was the Patriots move down if they don't like the third quarterback available. And the Patriots came out and said that they didn't get a serious offer in their opinion for that third spot. So maybe teams weren't willing to offer the farm to move up. Maybe they were offers, but none of the Patriots really liked. The Patriots probably said, we'll start the conversation at three first round picks. And teams probably weren't willing to offer that. I think it was Nick, our second call, said he wasn't in favor of moving up for Jane Daniels and selling the farm. And I guess a lot of teams agreed with Nick, our caller. Yeah. But I understand T. Dougie being bummed out about the quarterback position. But I, what I will say is that even if, worst case scenario, let's say the Raiders are stuck in this purgatory where they, they have seven to nine wins and miss the playoffs, right? At least you know you have a roster that's built to win now. You just need to get the quarterback right. Now, if you're in a situation where you're like, all right, we built this roster. We got a top 10 scoring defense. We got Devontae Adams, although he's on the other side of 30. We have offense with all these playmakers, Brock Bowers, Trey Tucker got some speed. You know, Zeus is coming on. Let's say Zeus has a good year. Offensive line is solidifying itself. You just need to get the quarterback in there. And they're going every, every offseason, they're going to be quarterback options, whether it be free agency or the draft. They're going to be quarterback options. And there's already talk. I know this is early discussion, but there's early talk that quarterbacks aren't going to go as high next year as they did this year. So there'll be a chance for the Reds to maybe move up a few spots and not have to sell the farm and to get a young quarterback with some promise, maybe Cam Ward, you know, who knows? I'm just throwing out a name, but I think the Reds will have a better shot at getting a young quarterback if they want one in next year's draft than they did in this year's draft. Yeah. And I'll say this too. He, he did bring up a good point and I'm not trying to throw uh, gasoline on the fire here, but he was, you know, bummed out that it seems like every other team has a franchise quarterback except the Raiders and the Seahawks. Well, I would argue the Browns don't. Deshaun Watson has not come well close with, yeah. at all. The Titans um, aren't sure. I mean, the Titans, Titans uh, went all in on Will Levis, but we don't know. If don't Will know. Levis face plants this year, get, the Titans are drafting a quarterback. If Daniel Jones doesn't look good this year, the Giants are drafting a quarterback. Correct. Uh, so there are, there are a handful of teams that, while they went all in with their quarterbacks, I could see them pivoting to a new quarterback if their quarterback struggles this upcoming Correct. Season. I mean, look, one of the most touted quarterback draft picks of all time, Trevor Lawrence. There's so question much. marks. He is not. He regressed terribly the last year. So, And then the guys that went out this year, yes, they drafted their quote-unquote hopeful franchise quarterback. But we don't know how Caleb Williams is going to do. We don't know how Jaden Daniels is going to do. So, Scott. so I I say that just to 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 tell T. Dougie, we don't know how they're going to work out. So when we get to week eight of next season, we'll see how many teams have a quote unquote franchise quarterback. Derek Carr, New Orleans. If the New Orleans yes. Saints don't do well, I could see the New Orleans Saints going in a different direction at quarterback. Even though they gave him a no trade clause, they could still cut them like the Raiders did and save about thirty million as a post June one release yeah, remember the saints have drafted developmental quarterbacks in the last two years they drafted jake hayner last year and then they drafted spencer rattler in the fifth round this year so uh, Derek yeah. Carr's situation may be a little you know, you know unstable absolutely. So 
Absolutely. Great call, T-Dougie. Okay, now we're staying on the West Coast, but we're going up to the Pacific Northwest to Orlando in Portland. Orlando in Portland. Hey, Mo and Scott. It's PNW Orlando calling from beautiful Portland, Oregon. Uh, you might also know me as uh, Derek Carr's hair. Derek's <laughs> ah, hair. Yeah. And, uh, oh boy, Garoppolo. Where have you been? I need to count. So Where have you been? Him. I digress. Uh, so haven't been, been listening for a while, haven't called in in a long time. I uh, wanted to call in, uh, to call out something, and that is what I'm terming uh, Mo's waiting to exhale moment. Uh, so what I mean by that is I've noticed that every time Mo, if there's a take, if there's something he doesn't like from Scott usually, but a caller, <laughs> he'll do one of these. <sighs> and usually <laughs> mumble something in his head, I can't, it's a little bit vulnerable. But uh, yeah. Uh, Mo's not good at hiding his feelings. Okay, with that said, I had a question for you guys and a way to exhale take for Mo. The question is, uh, with uh, now with Bowers and with Mayer at uh, tight end and also Harrison, people forget about him, but he's, he's a good one too. Um, what do you think this is going to impact the Raiders having a fullback? Uh, I'm going to assume that maybe we don't have a fullback or they don't have a fullback. Because uh, I could see Mayer in that, in that position sometimes uh, with Bowers in. Uh, it would be really interesting to see if they, they also go a triple tight end set. Because like I said, Harrison, Harrison's good. Man. Keep an eye on that guy. All right. Here's my waiting to exhale moment for Mo. And it's basically this. Aha, Thayer Mumford. Despite all the slings you sent to this man, he is it. The coaches believe in him. A lot of us in Raider Nation believe in him. And I'm excited for him next year uh, in his first Pro Bowl season. All right, boys, that's it. Really excited uh, for next year. Good draft. Appreciate all you do. Scott, one last thing. Never got my shirt. Oh. Uh, 59150. Don't know where it is. I'm sure it's in the mail uh, a oh, year later. But That's uh, terrible. But, yeah, Dude, never got that. my shirt. So we'll see Dude. if maybe, maybe it shows up one day. But Dude. appreciate it all. Have a great day. All right, man. You did no, not. Get, okay, that sucks. Well, for, we'll get to his comment in a second. But the shirt, I'm going to send you extra stuff. Reach back out to me. Change your handle on on Twitter to uh, Aiden O'Connell's mustache. Right? <laughs> I think that's your next one. I mean, or Gardner Minshew's hair mullet, whatever you want to call it. Um, but dude, I am sorry. Uh, we, we had a mullet. we had a his shirt issue. When we were giving out shirts last year, and I thought we got everybody taken care of. But dude, I'm sorry about that. And then Mo, tell him why you hate everything I say. <laughs> That's funny that he's very good at picking up people's mannerisms. Yeah, and and when he brought up the exhale that I do when I don't like a take, it's so true. I didn't think about it. I guess it's just one of those quirky things that you have when you don't know you're doing it. But it's funny how he he picked that up and was able to point that out because I I know I do do that because it's kind of like a oh boy now I gotta I gotta go into this I gotta answer this in a way I have to answer this Raider fans may not like it but you know and uh, it's good to have you back before I even get to the comment it's just yeah. good to have Derek Carr's hairs back at, at Minshew's mullet Minshew's mustache would be a great sort of thing for you but to to, to get into actual football you know, content discussion, mm -hmm. the fullback position. I think you could see, and I think Chip Tower said this last week, you could probably see Brock Bowers in that. Absolutely. Role. The Raiders may not have a traditional fullback on their depth chart, but they have two tight ends who could definitely fill that spot. Definitely uh, when the Raiders want to run the ball downhill, because you know what Antonio Pierce, the Raiders are going to run the football. Yeah. And if you remember, so it's, it's interesting with NFL offenses and stay with me on this one. But, you know, they change with the times. Things change. Some things go in fashion, then they're out of fashion. And in the 80s, back when old guys like me were learning football, watching football, they moved away from the fullback a lot. A lot of offenses used an H-back, sometimes called a slot back, whatever you want to call it, depending on the offense. So there was, a, especially the AFC, well, even the Raiders did it. The Raiders had H-backs. So... Mm -hmm. What you do is you swap out, and to your point about what Chip Towers told us about Brock Bowers, is um, I can see them, that, and that's why we talked about him being the Swiss Army knife. Because, yeah, you move away from the fullback, and I love fullbacks, but they're just not it right now. Some teams have them. Of course, the Raiders have had them. John Gruden was a guy who was going to use a fullback. 
But now with Brock Bowers there, and you say, well, he's going to catch the ball. No, he does it all. So I think that I think you'll see, and they might even have another guy that comes in at H back too uh, on the roster or somebody they sign in camp to play that position. And then you don't have to have a fullback. So to me, it was a great, great pickup there. And I think that it's something that uh, you'll see him do. And I, that's foreign to people because H back hasn't been a thing in the NFL, but it's starting to slowly come back. Also, shout out to Harrison Bryant. You know, he's not in a lot of our discussions because yeah. we're spending so much time talking about Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer. You know, Derek Carr's here brought up a good point about Harrison Bryant. He had some he had some good plays with the Browns this past season. He catched the football. He could also block. So he'll be involved. You may see 13 personnel with him in there, and he'll be able to contribute. Maybe not to the level as Mayer and Brock Bowers, but he'll definitely be involved in the offense. Yes. Yeah, so Orlando, by the way, that's his name. <clears throat> Orlando. Orlando, I'm going to take care of you, dude. If it, if if not, I will come on the air here and shame myself. In some and I'll give a way. big I'll give a big exhale for Scott for missing if he doesn't do it. Orlando will call and say, "Hey, finally got my Scott. stuff. I'm not only going to send you a T-shirt, dude. I'm going to send you a bunch of stuff. I'm going to leave it as a surprise. But please get in touch with me again, man. I can't believe you didn't get because <laughs> we had about six or seven people who were in that position, and everybody else." was good never heard from anybody else that they didn't get their stuff so please reach out to me great call from portland hope you're doing well orlando. Up there. orlando that's orlando for showing up again on the scene right now we're going to the lone star state we're going down to texas for our night we're all over the country i love it here we go hey what's up scott what's up mo obi-wan raider calling in obi-wan texas i uh, just want to say love the show guys keep it up and um, this has been a refreshing draft. It uh, looks like it was a draft that was actually well managed. Alexa, shut up. <laughs> Alexa, shut up. Um, really, um, don't have too many gripes about the draft other than Atlanta screwing us out of our quarterback. <laughs> um I'm really want to see that Air Force kid, Trey Taylor, the Jim Thorpe Award winner, nation's best DB. I really like JPJ. He reminds me of uh, Richie Incognito. He's going to be nasty. He's going to mm -hmm. be so nasty. I can't wait for the season to start. I saw that little uh, tweet <laughs> that um, Alt put out there saying he wants to whoop Max Crosby's ass. He does not know what he's getting himself into. <laughs> Max Crosby's going to eat that kid for lunch. At any rate, thank you guys for what you're putting out there, for the hard work you're doing for Raider Nation, keeping us all informed. And uh, go Raiders. I give the draft a solid A-. <laughs> uh, I can't fault them for not getting a quarterback. There's nobody there to get. And they didn't do anything stupid like Drafting Spencer Rattler in the first or second round. He wasn't that type of talent. And they did pick up a quarterback as an a UDFA. Um, past regimes would have drafted a quarterback. They'd have probably drafted Spencer Rattler in the first damn round. <laughs> so um, it's refreshing to see somebody with Tom Telesco and Pierce right in the ship we have a direction we're headed and that's refreshing to see obi-wan raider and i'm out all right obi-wan raider down in texas appreciate the call very good stuff uh and yes i think that uh i think he's right that and it's funny because I still have questions. We have questions on Luke Getze. I still have questions to see how Pierce is going to do with a full season. But I agree with him, Mo. I think for the first time since you and I have been doing the show together, and even before that, uh, I feel like there is a direction. <laughs> and it's, it's palpable. You can see it. You know, Gruden talked about stuff like that, and 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 Josh McDummy talked about it. But but. It never really played out with this one, with the draft, with the free agents. It all seems to fit in with exactly what they've been saying. So Josh McDaniels' plans usually play out in the preseason, and, and when they got to the season, it would just go to you know down the, down the toilet. Like if yes. you remember, the Raiders Raiders were like preseason champs. You know they right. went undefeated one one preseason, 
and you're thinking, okay, they have a direction and get to regular season, it looks all discombobulated. With this team, and I said this on draft day, the reason why I like this draft class over previous draft classes is there's a there's a identity. This team and Antonio Pierce set that identity when he took yes, over he last year for Josh McDaniels. And now it's continued into the offseason where the Raiders are getting physical football players, Brock Bowers, JPJ, right? And they also when they did take a chance for some of the picks that may be more projects, they're physical. They're I want to say physical, but they they have the physical tools. So they have these, you know, they can run a four three, you know, high four threes, or they have ball production. Maybe they are high IQ players who've you know had high ball production. That's why I like MJ Devonshire uh, coming in early and making contributions. I talked about his ball production: eighteen pass breakups, seven interceptions his last two three years. So they have high IQ players that aren't reckless physical high IQ, not reckless so when you think about the reckless players like damon arnett john abrams you know those guys were physical but didn't always make the best decision on the football field they draw penalties so the raiders were one of the most disciplined football teams i believe the least penalized football team last year mm -hmm. so they have a physicality and they have the high IQ players to execute on the football field that's what you should feel good about and that's what they drafted this year in 2024. Well said. And I, I want to echo too what he said about Trey Taylor. It, uh, listen, you, you've been talking a lot about Devin Shire and I agree with you, but like mm -hmm. Taylor's the guy I'm really excited about. He lacks a little speed, but with coaching in the NFL technique and whatnot, I, I'm not saying he's going to come out and be an all pro year number one. He may be, I don't know, but he did win the Thorpe award. And the thing I like most about this, and you talked about it, the type of player that they're, that they're drafting and they're signing Trey Taylor went to the Air Force Academy. You want to talk about discipline and leadership? Champ Kelly talked about him uh, on Wednesday's press conference too, because this kid is mature. When you, for those of you who don't have a lot of familiarity with the service academies, you don't, I mean, you are at, you might as well be in an Ivy League school from an academic standpoint. And then you add in the military side of it with the discipline, the leadership, how you have to lead other men. This is a guy that I think, you know, this is, this is a pure sky. It's a pure sky. And so I think that it's going to be fun to watch them and see these young kids develop. So very good. Obi-Wan Raider. I appreciate the call, man, as mm -hmm. always. And uh, now we're going back to Northern California. Long time listener. I haven't heard from him in a while either. And that's NorCal Raider. NorCal Raider. Here he is. Hey, Sha. Hey, Mo. Um, this is NorCal Raider out of uh, Woodland, California, uh, north of Sacramento. Um, I just, I just have a couple, I was just thinking a couple of things, you know, with this draft, you know, that we just had, you know, we chose best player available. Um, I think that philosophy is pretty good because we have an experienced GM and for a long time, you know, even we had Renji McKenzie and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, um, the guy from the Patriots, I can't even think of his name right now. Um, you guys were all like, <laughs> the GMs, they were kind of like, you know, they were more of a personnel. They weren't really, they, they didn't, they didn't understand the draft concept. And I think the best player available draft mentality is a really good thing because if you go back to many, many years ago, back in 04, um, 2004, like if we would have chose the best player available instead of picking a tackle like Robert Gallery, we could have chosen because we, we were going based on need. Um, um, we didn't we didn't go by um, the best player available. We could have gotten Larry Fitzgerald or or even gotten um, you know uh, I believe uh, the guy from the Lions. Uh, um, Megatron. I can't even, it was him either. Calvin Johnson. Uh, yep. Johnson. You know, we could have got Calvin Johnson or, or you know, one of those players, and and uh, or even Eli Manning or one of those guys. So I think the philosophy of just of just being a, being aggressive and and going out to getting the best player available. That's a that's a, a said going over need. Um, you know, um, I think that that's a big deal. I always want to allocate money into my offensive line the most. Cause that's the most critical thing. Um, and then er, that everything else. And then from there you could just build. So hopefully, um, uh, hopefully we start we continue with this philosophy. You know, like even a couple of years ago um, when uh, Herbert got drafted, um, we honestly um, we could have even drafted some of those quarterbacks coming out. Um, we could we should have replaced you know our, our existing quarterback or at least planned for it before we cut ties. And now we're kind of in a situation where where things are kind of up in the air. So, but um, if things go well or things go 50-50 this year. Um, next year, there's not a lot of teams that, that have quarterback needs, so we might have a chance to get a quarterback for sure um, in the first round. Uh, but that's all I got to say about that. Um, uh, keep pushing, guys. Uh, good job. All right, there you go, NorCal Raider. Good to hear from you, man. I appreciate that very much. 
uh, you calling in, but uh, good points, Mo, <clears throat> as usual. And that's what I was saying to T. Dougie, who was kind of bummed out that the Raiders didn't draft the quarterback. While you may have to sit through year of hopefully not, hopefully the Raiders go to the playoffs, but if they don't and they're stuck in this, again, seven to nine win range and they're in just middle ground, which nobody wants to be in because you either want to bottom out to get the quarterback at the top of the draft or you want to be a playoff team. If the Raiders are stuck in this middle ground, I think next year could be the year that they can get their young quarterback because, as the caller said, a lot more teams, a lot fewer teams will need a quarterback next year than they, than this year. So the Raiders will be able to move up or maybe be able to stay where they are if they're in the middle of the draft or maybe they can stay in that 15, 13 to 17 range and draft a young quarterback. You know, who knows, for HC, a quarterback may hit for HC. I know there's going to be a lot of talk about Dak Prescott. He's going to be the big name because he's coming up into a contract year. Mm -hmm. His contract expires after the 2024 season. So just like Kirk Cousins was the big name who moved, Dak Prescott could be the big name who moves Next year, but I would, if I'm the Raiders, I'd still, regardless of what they do in free agency, I want to draft the quarterback because you want that long term player who's going to get you set for the decade, for a decade or more. Correct. And the other thing to think about here, too, and you, you kind of touched on a little bit earlier in the show, Mo, was the fact that the Raiders addressed a lot of needs this year. I mean, they still have mm -hmm. some open spots they need to figure out outside cornerback and some of that stuff. But if if their draft class, if they did really well on their draft class, if JPJ does what people think he does, if DJ Glaze comes along and is at least a good swing guy, uh, and and Thayer Munford Jr. performs and gets better and has a high level and they answer, he's our right tackle, and everybody else does well and the quarterbacks do okay, then suddenly you're in that position next year where it's like, yeah, uh, we finished eight and nine or we finished nine and eight and we're picking tenth, but now. We were on the cusp. We lost three games by less than three points, whatever it is, right? So you, you we'll see how the season plays out. But then you're like saying to yourself, we just need a quarterback. We need we need a guy who's going to come in. So guess what we do? We can trade up or we trade with another team who's looking to dump a quarter. I don't know. But, but to your point, you then are in the position where the glaring, glaring need of, to get us to the next step would be a quarterback. And then you can, you can trade draft capital because you've done well in this draft. Uh, you've done well in free agency, and and you can then go for it, right? Like some of the teams did this year, right? And I think that's that would be the consolation prize of being stuck in this middle ground. But you would say, okay, if not for below average or just average quarterback play, the Rays have been a playoff team. Oh man! But the rest of our roster is pretty much set. We'll yeah. see what happens at cornerback and right tackle. But you could say well, most of the roster now, you may lose some players here and there for agency, but you'll have some money to you know replace them. You know, linebacker maybe, but I think Tom Tommy Eichberg is going to be the guy after Robert Splane or or uh, Divine Diablo, you know, moves on. So you'll have a lot of you'll have a roster that's ready to compete right away. And yes. then, as you said, you could just say, okay, we have we don't have that many needs, so we can take we can roll the dice on on trading up or using draft capital for quarterback because we we've already filled a lot of our needs. We already have players who are ready to start now. We just need the quarterback. Right. And and again, too, you look at the Raiders contract situation. You got a couple big ones. Of course, Devontae Adams gets massive next year. I yeah. still think they'll restructure it. I think he'll do that, yeah. especially if they can have a good season. They might even do it before mm -hmm. the start of this season. Mm -hmm. So so you look at that. And so you're this is where you want to be in the NFL. Mo. You want to have as many young guys that are performing and role players that you brought in as free agents that are that are not making a ton of money. You have enough guys on lower contracts that you then fill spots, right? You can go get a huge free agent, let's say a cornerback if you need to next year, and then you can go draft your quarterback. And oh, by the way, somebody leaves, you can fill that spot with another guy because you have the money and the ability to do it. That's why the draft's so important, to keep your payroll in line and to be able to build. And when it's time to press on the gas, you're able to do it. So good stuff. Appreciate it, NorCal Raider. All right. Our good friend Tarek. Let's see where Tarek is this week because he calls in every week and he's traveling everywhere. Uh, he was in, where was he last week? Chicago? Before that, he was here in Cincinnati. Now we'll see where he's at. Tarek. Indiana. Good evening, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek calling at you guys from Columbus, Ohio. Oh, right up the highway. Oh, well, uh, talking a little bit more Raiders as we get closer and closer to OTAs and minicamp. I do love what Telesco's doing. He continues post draft to bring in competition and depth at all positions. Uh, we brought in Andre Pete, former Pro Bowl right tackle from Saints. I was surprised to see that we got Gallup in there for competition. We brought in Guyton, receiver, uh, former Charger. I think the offensive line is starting to come together. It looks really, really solid. I think the only position that is a question mark currently is right tackle. 
Um, been doing a little bit more research on Brock Bowers, and uh, um, I read that this dude is going to be Hunter Renfro on steroids. So excited to see what he brings to the table as a rookie. We will have more cap money following June 1st. Um, I'm excited to see um, Alexander Madison. Uh, keep forgetting about him, the big back we brought in from Minnesota. I wonder, wonder how he's going to do paired up with Zamir White. Um, and I think um, the only question mark is really um, in a, in a, a quarterback-heavy conference is, is AOC or Minshew. Obviously, that's premature, I mean, especially when you're putting in a new offensive system. I guess it's whoever has the better camp. Um, so I, I'm curious what you guys' thoughts are on those two quarterbacks because that seems to be the only missing piece. And realistically, um, again, premature, but what are the expectations going to be? How big of a leap? can and will the Raiders make. I, I do think they're going to be substantially improved. Um, and, and prematurely, I'm saying something like maybe 10 wins tops. But uh, when you have a new system in place with, um, you know, without that franchise quarterback, um, then it leads me to the points I made recently when I had said that, um, you know, we don't have that, that franchise guy, but hopefully the guy behind center can distribute the football, protect the football, not make any mistakes and play consistently. So, uh, let me know what you guys think um, as we get closer to mini camps and OTAs. Um, looking forward to your guys' show this week. Have a wonderful week, and I will talk to you guys later. Over and out from Columbus. Go Raiders. Bye bye. All right, there's Tarek. Always good, positive energy from Tarek too, which I you mm-hmm. can get it over the phone. Even I appreciate that. The yep. only bone I have to pick with you, Tarek, is don't compare Brock Bowers to Hunter Renfro. Hunter Renfro was a fifth round pick, and yes, he had some great moments for the Raiders, but they're not even comparable. But I get what you're saying. Anyway, um, Mo, I, I, listen, it's a good question, and I'm, I'm I'm summarizing here, but how good can this Raider team be is a good question. I think, to me, I think we're going to see the defense continue to grow and get better. Now, you got the one question at cornerback. We'll see how it goes. But I, I have every faith in Patrick Graham and the roster they have and where they've filled spots in. The offense, we talked about it, all the tools. To me, the, the huge question marks and, and how this team will do and where it will go are Luke Getze and the quarterback position. Well, Scott, I will say if Hunter Renfro did take steroids, he might look a little like Brock Bowers. I'm just saying. I'm just giving that hey, Hunter was really part quick. of the show for a year. He was on our show for a year every week. I love the guy. I'm just saying. No, in all seriousness, um, I'll get to the quarterback question because Tarek wanted our opinion on the two quarterbacks. And yeah. I want to make this clear again. I mean, I, you probably said this 50 million times. We don't dislike Aiden O'Connell on this show. I actually think the quarterback competition is going to be a spirited battle. I think it's going to be close. Yes. I, I don't think you're going to know who the Raiders are going to start a quarterback maybe until the last week of preseason. I think that battle is going to go down to the wire. But as you said, you hinted to it, Gardner Minshew could just do a little more physically than Aiden O'Connell, and he has the experience edge. That's why – I don't want to speak for Scott. That's why I think he has the edge in this battle. There was also a tweet from Rap Sheet. When the, when the Denver Broncos took Bo Nix, Ian Rapport of the NFL Network had a tweet, had a post that said, you know, Bo Nix off the board to the Denver Broncos. It looks like it's Minshew time in Las Vegas. He didn't say, oh, it looks like it's going to be a quarterback battle. He said, it looks like it's going to be Minshew time. So not only us, but a lot of the national reporters – have an inkling that Minshew is at least a front runner for the position. That doesn't mean he's going to win the job. No. But going into camp, a lot of people see Minshew as the front runner, even though Aiden O'Connell was there last year. Just remember, it's a new offense. So you're giving the edge to the, to the veteran, the more veteran quarterback with more experience, who, as we've said, almost got to the playoffs with the Colts. Now, Aiden O'Connell's team went 8-9. and not, not a lot his fault. A lot of that on Josh McDaniels. We get it. But... Aiden O'Connell had some clumper, clunkers against good teams. You remember the Vikings game. Mm-hmm. Remember the Chiefs game. So I'm not trying to bring Aiden O'Connell down, but let's keep in mind against good teams or teams with winning records or teams that were viable for a playoff spot, he did struggle. And I think that's where the question marks come in with Aiden O'Connell. Not to say he can't improve because you would hope over the course of the offseason he does show improvement, which is why I do think it will be a close battle. But I think when it comes down to it, when you're looking at the roster, we talked about it, Scott. This is a roster that's ready to win now. You're looking for the best quarterback on the field, and that I think that's going to be Gardner Minshew after the preseason. Right. You talked a lot about it, reporters. Vic Tafer, of course, one of the beat writers for the Raiders, for the Athletic. Um, I read a piece from him today where it basically ended saying, and, it, you know, Brock Bowers, and it's going to have a great 
impact for Gardner Minshew. Like, I think a lot of people believe that. It's not to say it's not an open competition. I believe Antonio so, Pierce. I take him at face value. I think it's a completely open competition going into camp. And I, I get heat because I say that Aiden O'Connell is not going to be a franchise quarterback. I just don't think he will be. People disagree and say they're going to come back and tell me they told me so. Great. If he does, that's fantastic for the Raiders. That means you found the guy in the fourth round. Everybody wins. That's awesome. I'll be the first one to say awesome. But I, I just don't see it happening. I'm not an expert. I'm not somebody who's been right on every quarterback. I like Josh Rosen, for Christ's sake. But I will say, I will say, based on what you just said, I think Minshew has the edge. Doesn't mean he's going to win it because Aiden O'Connell could ball out. Him and Luke Getze could find magic. You never know. But it's going to be fun to watch it in camp and to see who the best quarterback will be for this Raiders team to use all those weapons. All right. Thanks, Tarek. Appreciate it. All right. Our last call of the night, as always, is our good friend Jacob in Fresno. Cat. And many, many This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? Woo! That was a rough one. Had to almost take a breath there. Uh, how you guys doing? Good, Jacob. Yeah, uh, it's the middle of the week, <laughs> as always. I don't know why I'm saying that, but I am. Anyway, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you guys went through on, uh, was it Monday or Sunday? Monday show? Tuesday show? The show you did earlier this week. <laughs> Talking about Josh Jacobs, and you went on a little bit about the Tom Brady uh, roast and the sensitivities that we have as a culture today. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about Josh Jacobs. I go back and forth with this because part of me is like, yeah, what's your problem, Josh? Why can't you be a little bit nicer to the fans? But then I see the whole other side of why can't our fans just treat Josh Jacobs like he's, a, <laughs> I don't know, a human being? Maybe. Because, I mean, we were pretty ridiculous to him. I, mean, I wasn't, but, I mean, collectively, Raider Nation, we were pretty – we're pretty uh, brutal with a guy that we claim to want on our team. Like, why can't he just take a pay cut? Why can't he just stop whining on the internet? I get that. But he does also have a mother and a father. I get that. But he is also a human. <laughs> the guy wants what's best for him. That makes sense. I mean, he's going to just try and have a good career. He's going to try to do that. Ah. Uh, but at the same point, you know, once a Raider, always a Raider, you want the guy to respect the shield. And it kind of felt like he didn't really respect the shield on the way out. Mm -hmm. And that was a shame. Uh, in terms of the Tom Brady thing, it's the same kind of thing. Can we treat Aaron Rodgers' family like they're humans? Or not Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Hernandez. Yeah, Can we treat players like they're humans? We have to remember these guys are there for our entertainment. But when they're not there for our entertainment, they have their own lives after that. You know, they're, they're real people. They're not just faces that we know. They're actually real people with souls. And I think we can forget that. My question for the week. Who are you guys most excited about that we drafted? I'm really looking forward to see Jackson Powers Johnson. That guy's going to be a beast. And uh, I don't know, that's about it. You guys take it easy. Go Raiders. There you go. Jacob, I don't know why he even says his name anymore. You know immediately who it is. <laughs> Maybe for the people who are just watching the show for the first time. First time. Yeah, um, first time listeners. Yes. His point about Josh Jacobs, and and then I got some good reaction to this too. Most people were of the the thought, like, he doesn't know us anything. Like, when he plays, he's not a Raider anymore, so good luck to you. Um, is, is, is you're right. People, you know, people treat these athletes sometimes because they have access to them in a way they've never had via social media. Uh they go at these guys like like these guys actually they can you can you can be a player and care about fans mo but people would post to him mad at him because he didn't have a good game for their fantasy team they would post at him for the holdout they would post it, all this kind of stuff and then when he leaves i think it's the same people i don't think it's people like jacob or most of you watching the show i think it's people who are just extremists with all that stuff with social media. They don't know how to handle themselves in the real world, let alone online. And so, so they do this. So, so his point is well taken. If you're going to treat somebody a certain way, I'm not saying you all treated Josh Jacobs bad because you didn't. A lot of people loved him or his jersey, all that stuff. But he has a great point there that we didn't touch on um, last time we talked about it. 
Yeah, I'll say this. I think most people were, you know, respectful of Josh Jacobs or just said or indifferent said, well, okay, he he did what's best for him. We move on. I'm a Raider fan. He's now a Green Bay Packer. I appreciate the time he played for my team, but now I move on just like he moved on. I think most people are of that mindset. Yeah. Of course, you get on Twitter, you go on social media, you're going to get the, the, you know, the whack jobs out there <laughs> who complain about their fancy team and DM him. Hey, I need, you know, 100 yards and two touchdowns for my fancy team. Like, that's going to really matter or motivate him. It's not. Exactly. Uh, but one one point I do want to touch on, though, and I, and I kind of touched on it last week that I want to kind of expand on. To me, it goes both ways where, okay, fans want players to be respectful of the show on the way out. But our fans always respectful to all players who are no longer Raiders if they didn't play well. So I brought Damon Arnett and Alex Leatherwood. There was no outrage. I didn't see a, a, a long tweet from Alex Leatherwood thanking Raider Nation and thanking the Raiders for giving me an opportunity, and no one said anything about it. No one said any, a word because he wasn't good. So <laughs> is, it, is it about that Josh Jacobs didn't say goodbye, or was it that he was a good player who didn't say goodbye? Yeah. So it's, you're not treating all Raiders equally. It's only the good players you hold to that standard. Correct. And I think it's a bit, you know, double-sided. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great point. Now, his point about we were talking about the Brady roast and Aaron Hernandez. So mm -hmm. I get what he's saying there. And you're absolutely right. You know, Aaron Hernandez had, I think, one or two kids. Um, and and his his wife or girlfriend, I don't know if they were married or not came out to say that it was, you know, not great for them and this kind of stuff. And while I understand that, look, a roast is a roast. The most inappropriate things are said in these roasts. And yes, but remember, his children have to walk around and they could turn on ESPN and there's a 30 for 30 on Aaron Hernandez about how he killed people. So I'm not excusing it. I'm not, I'm not, I, I just think though that yes, it, are there things that cross the line? There probably are. In, but but we're also in a society today, and I'll get on my soapbox for like two seconds, mm -hmm. where the most crass stuff is acceptable. So I'm not defending those jokes, but I'm saying I'm not surprised by them, nor should anyone, because I can walk in a grocery store and I'm sometimes sit, I was in I was in a restaurant real quick, sorry, quick, 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 quick story with my kids. We go, we stop at a little restaurant to have a burger and there's these other like I'd say early twenties, I call them kids sitting next to us and they're dropping F bombs and they're talking about stuff, you know, and it's like, look, I don't care if I'm in a bar where there's adults, but that kind of stuff is acceptable in society today. Like they don't even bat an eye. Right. I see it from teenagers. I see all, the, all over the place. So again, not excusing it. And I think you have a great point, Jacob. I really do. But I think that's indicative of where we are as a culture right now is a lot of that stuff happens. It's acceptable. You see it on TV. I know Netflix is a pay, pay, uh, pay channel, but nonetheless, you see it everywhere. You see it on regular TV more than you do. When I was a kid, they couldn't curse on TV. They couldn't do this. And now you see people butt naked on TV. So there you go. My, my main point is that is that just because it's allowed doesn't mean it's okay. So right. like you, Scott, I'm not okaying, you know, the, the jokes about Aaron Hernandez and his right. family. They didn't have, they didn't have to cross that line. Right. But there are a lot of things in today's world that people don't have to do and it's done. And you just kind of have to just roll with the punches, fair or not, whether it's fair or not. And I was saying you should be subjected to that. But if you know that a roast is going to happen, I would just do my best to tune it out. Now, his you know, kids are going to run into other people that may poke jokes and stuff like that. Oh, did you, your dad was, you know, was mentioned on the roast. They can't escape that stuff. But such is life. When you have a father who was a celebrity and NFL player, well known, that's what comes with it. And yeah. unfortunately, things that he did are now going to rub off on his children, which they had nothing to do with. So I feel, I think of all of this, I feel sorry for his kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sins of the father. It happens all the time. Again, not an excuse or, or not okaying it. Because again, I think, I think you can go too far. I like comedy. I like crass comedy. I thought some of that roast was fantastic. But I thought, yeah, I mean, when you start using that joke over and over and you're going back to it, it's like, okay, all right. How, now, these guys all write their own stuff, so they don't know what other people are writing. But my point is that you have a situation where, you know, again, what's acceptable and what's not anymore. I mean, listen, on this show, especially on YouTube, 
we get some of the craziest comments. You don't see them because I, I, I moderate them because they are so crazy and out of left field. And I'm not talking about telling me I'm wrong or I'm stupid or whatever. I can deal with that. It comes with the territory. Personal right? attacks. But personal, <laughs> and I'm not talking just, I'm talking personal attacks that cross the line. Look, you got a show here with a white dude and a black dude. I get stuff. I get racial stuff. I get jokes about our appearances. I get things like, I bet your wife is this, and I bet you're this. And I, look, it, it happens, and it's terrible that people would even think to do that, you know, but it happens. So, again, that's where we are, unfortunately. But I appreciate Jacob calling it out because I think it's worthy of discussion. Um, and it's good for all of us because we live in the culture. It's good for all of us to think about it. We like these guys. We respect them. We root them on. And so, but as Jacob said, they're human beings. They have a soul. So just remember that when you get mad because a guy fumbled or a guy threw an interception. Like, you can be upset about it, but there's no need to make it personal. Or when a guy has an opinion on a on a sports show and you don't like his opinion and you want to <laughs> stalk his address or talk about his family or something like that, just remember that guy or woman has a family. Yeah. And we're not even close to the level of celebrity as athletes. Yeah. But Scott, I don't tell this. I don't tell these stories on air. But when I give, when I criticize Raiders for certain things, and I tell people, I don't. I'm not here to help you believe in the Raiders. I'm not here to wave pom poms for Raiders. The only thing I owe you as as a sports writer, as a sportscaster, is my honesty. I'm That's gonna it. be authentic, good That's or bad. It. I'm gonna be authentic. Right. And sometimes when I'm a little more on the critical side. You wouldn't believe some of the messages I get. I'm not here to cry on my soapbox, but no, I understand with the job that I have, that comes with it. I'm a human too, and I understand it's not what I want to see in my DMs or my messages or my emails, people trying to you know, figure out where I am or where I live, my family and stuff like that. But I understood when I took this job, what comes with it, right? So yeah. when you marry a football player or a sports athlete, <laughs> You got to understand what comes with it. Now, the kids that come along didn't sign up for that. No, they were just brought into this world. And that's why I said, going back to this Rosa and Hernandez, I feel bad most for the kids because they're just brought into a situation not knowing, okay, now I have to deal with this at school or if they're older at work once they grow up. That's who I feel sorry for. Yeah. And, and listen, again, I know how you guys all feel about Tom Brady, even though he's going to be an owner of the Raiders. Um and I felt bad for him, you know, one or two divorce jokes. Again, he's got kids too. And I know nobody's crying for them because they're, they live in a lap of luxury and all that stuff. But, um, that too, like I felt uncomfortable because it was used so much. And again, he's got kids and you can say, well, they're not watching the Netflix special. They're younger or whatever, but you know what? Now we all have phones. We have phones. These kids see stuff because guess what? All those bits from that thing were put into TikTok wow. and they were put into Instagram. So guess what? They, the kids are going to see it. All right. So, it, and I, I'm fortunate. I didn't, my parents stayed married. I didn't, wasn't part of a divorce, but I, I know people who were. And when you're a kid and your parents get divorced, uh, it's painful. And so right. for people to make light of it now, again, he signed up for it. I get it, but it's, it's tough for them. So you're right though. And, and again, we're, we're here. We give our opinions. You don't have to like us. If you don't like us, you don't have to watch us. You don't have to read us. You don't have to do that. There's members of the media that I'm not high on their work. I don't, I don't partake in it. I don't watch it, but I don't go talking bad about them. I get people DMing me all the time. Did you see so-and-so story? Is, is he a jerk or what? Is he the, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not going there. Right. Because we all have people who like what we do. We have people who don't like what we do. And that's everybody, no matter how much you think somebody's loved, there's always somebody who doesn't like them. So anyway, but we put up with it because we love talking to you guys. And again, look at this. We're almost at an hour and a half this show. So yes, we're not doing as many shows, but look at this hour and a half, mostly calls. So we appreciate it. And Mo's a little under the weather too. So he, he, he gamed up. That's probable coming into the show. Probable. <laughs> probable. Yes. <laughs> it was a game time decision, but he made game the game time, time decision. decision. So it's all good. Mo, uh, before we check out, let everybody know we're talking to everybody on Thursday Anything you want to tell people about coming up in your world over the next couple of days? So Tarek tried to get me to tip my hand on what I think the Raiders are going to be with their win-loss record. And I didn't answer Tarek just for that reason. <laughs> for this reason, I have a BR Live coming up on the day of the schedule release. So Wednesday, the NFL Wednesday. made an announcement that the schedule will be released on Wednesday, May 15th. I will be on Bleach Report Live giving my game-by-game -game predictions for the Raiders and telling you what I think they're going to end up 
at the end of the season with their win-loss record. Last year, I predicted every game under Josh McDaniels correctly, and I started off 9-0. and Now, of course, the race changed their head coach, so no way I can predict the rest of those games. But I'd say I did pretty well last year, so tune in for that Wednesday once the schedule releases. Be our app. I'll be there for a half hour going over all the games. There you go. See? All right, so make sure you do that. And I'm actually glad they moved the schedule because – we might have conflicted with it with your live and trying to do a show and talk about it. So that's what's great. Is so we'll be we'll be back, of course, on Tuesday, but then next Thursday we'll be able to talk about the schedule after Mo does his live and we we get his you'll hear it first from him there. But then if you miss the Bleacher Report live, we'll find you, we'll hunt you down and we'll kick, <laughs> kick you out of Raider Nation. But no, but we'll have it on the show on Thursday as well. Working on a couple guests too. I'm I'm trying hard to get a couple. Yes, I think the Raider fans will like. So stick with us on that one. But we appreciate you being with us again. Subscribe to the show if you don't already do it. We usually don't go an hour and a half, but man, there was so many great calls. I mean, there was not a bad call today, Mo. And not that we get bad calls anyway, but man, just you guys impress me. And and listen, I know every group of people has idiots and people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, but I will tell you that our listeners and viewers even in the chat live on YouTube, you can mm -hmm. see on the side right now, they they have great stuff. They have great knowledge. Even when they disagree with us, um, they make great points. And man, I love doing these shows. And during the season, we do a whole show where it's just uh, uh, um, uh, reader mail and stuff like that. So, so thank you guys for calling in and being part of the show. You make the show better. And don't forget that because without you, we would not be here. So thank you. A lot of our call, a lot of our calls do good research. Our first call set the tone with his research on the Packers and their offense. Like that set the tone for that for that segment. And a lot of the calls again doing a lot of research, doing a lot of digging on Brock Bowers, getting familiar with the Raiders players. It's good to see. It's good to hear. Yes, they're all they're all little Mo Motons. <laughs> no, they're all their own people. There's all there's only with one Mo. There's only one Tarek. There's only one Nick. There's only one Obi Wan Raiders, only one Orlando Raiders. Derek Carr's hair, how, how he wants to be called. Look Everyone at that individually. Look at that recall on all the names. So good. Gotta like that. See, that's how important you guys are to us. So thank you very much. And I didn't screw up anybody's name tonight, so that's good too, because that's happened a couple of times. So uh, we'll be good. But Orlando, don't forget to message me because I'm not only just sending you a T-shirt. I'm going to send you some cool stuff, some other cool stuff in addition to a T-shirt. I should say T-shirts. Man, that's terrible. All right. For our producer, Mike Robier, for Mr. Mo Moten, I'm Scott Colbranson. This has been Silver and Black today. We will see you guys Tuesday. Take care of one another and have a great weekend. Bye-bye now.